Hello, everyone. Today, Xiang Qian and I will give a deep dive of Kubernetes Data Protection Working Group. My name is Xingyang. I work at VMware in the Cloud Native Storage team. I'm also co-chair of CNCF Tech Storage and Kubernetes Six Storage. I work with Xiang Qian in the Data Protection Working Group. Hello, everyone. This is Sean Chen. I am a software engineer in Google. I um, lead the data protection working group, uh, group in Kubernetes along with Shin. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we have a pretty full agenda today. Uh, as you roll, we will quickly go through what are the motivations, what problems we're trying to solve within this data protection working group. And uh, we'll scan through the enterprises and com companies that get involved in this uh, effort. And we have some exciting key updates that we want to share with you all today. And then we will spend vast majority of the time deep diving into different components and what kind of progress this group has been making in the past year or two. Uh, lastly, Shin will go through how can you get involved into this data protection working group? Moving on to next slides. So um, it, motivation wise, we all are aware that day one operations for stateful workloads are very well supported as of today for Kubernetes users. Uh, we have uh, constructs like persistent volume uh, claims and persistent volumes that has its uh, life cycle kind of you know detached from the crisis life cycle. Uh, various operations is, is supported over there, including provision of uh, volume, deletion of volume, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then we have a good amount of workload API that allows you to use uh, persistent volumes to deploy your um, stateful workloads in the Kubernetes context, uh, such as deployments, stateful sets, daemon sets, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, with more and more stateful workloads moving to, into Kubernetes because it gives you benefits in like easy ease of management of uh, scanning, et cetera, et cetera. And we observed the uh, great productivity, productivity uh, gains of moving from uh, more legacy infrastructure into a uh, Kubernetes environment. Uh, with that drive, uh, we see more and more gaps for day two operations to protect your value, valuable data assets in the Kubernetes environment. Uh, there are tools like GitOps or uh, GitOps, which can effectively protect in your application configuration, but there are still significant gaps in terms of protecting your application's state. In other words, your application's data in Kubernetes context. So uh, this is the main motivation of this data protection working group. Uh, and we are focusing on compo building components or proposing components to support day two operations. Next slide, please. Uh, thanks to all that who, are con who have been contributing into this working group, those are a list of companies that are supporting this initiative. Uh, if you don't see your name over there, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or Shin. We're more than happy to add it. Um, next slide. There are some key updates I want to share with this group here. Uh, the first thing is that we have published a white paper. It's a very long white paper that clearly articulates what are the projects and what, what as a working group, what do we see are the problems and where are the gaps in Kubernetes and what are the components this whole group is working on and some of the directions we are taking. Uh, in the second link, it's annual report, which documents what have been achieved in the past 2022 year. Uh, and then what's looking forward, what this group will continue to focus upon. Uh, we do have uh, quite a bit of talks in the past uh, below uh, all the links. If you're interested, uh, please go ahead and watch them. Next slide, please. Now, before we 
dive into individual components, let's revisit a little bit what do we see as an application backup in Kubernetes context and also the restoration data. So uh, starting all the way to the left, um, what we want to eventually do is application level backup uh, in the backup workflow. And typical application consists two parts for a stateful workload. One is the Kubernetes resources that uh, shapes the application. For example, how many pods, how many persistent volumes it needs, and how uh, how it should be scaled, how much memory, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the other big piece is the so-called data backup. Uh, the data backup are the data that are stored on persistent volumes. Right? Persistent volumes can well be a storage system back, uh, externally managed storage system backed volumes that attach to your part. So uh, typically it's managed outside of the Kubernetes itself. So uh, application backup contains two pieces. As you can imagine, one of the big thing we want to solve is, okay, how do I effectively define an application? For example, your uh, simple web service can contain a service entry, uh, and maybe sometimes a Istio entry, some secrets mounted to the application, uh, to the application uh, and then your deployment or, or state for set, et cetera, et cetera. And all these are the Kubernetes resources that constructs your application. Uh, on the data front, we uh, have uh, all the data stored on the persistent volume. And obviously there are many ways of how you can back up your volume, right? We distinguish this by roughly two categories. One is so-called native data uh, dump, and the other is so-called uh, controller co uh, coordinated or orchestrated um, volume backups. Uh, native data dumps, can include like MySQL dumps, et cetera, et cetera. And controller coordinated can be uh, volume snapshot based or change block based, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then of course it has the mechanisms to support quiet in your application and then unquiet it afterwards such that we can achieve application consistency. So on the right hand side, uh, other building blocks we think uh, that is needed to support the entire blue entry of your uh, application backup workflow. Uh, the green boxes are existing today. Some good news over here uh, in 1.27 and uh, the consistent volume group snapshot support has been uh, released to alpha and uh, the volume model convention has been released to beta. Uh, we have Kazi, which is the object storage uh, initiative to uh, natively support uh, back uh, object storage bucket provisioning and permission management. Uh, it has been an offer in 1.25. Uh, Shin and I will give more details later on what are exactly those components be doing. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the restore workflow uh, is typically the reverse, right? Though. So uh, you have backup, you want to restore your application to pre previously uh, preserved state. So, uh, from time to time, the most challenging piece is the PVC PV restoration in Kubernetes context. It needs quite a bit of special handling. And that's where uh, components like volume snapshot, uh, rehydrating the PVC come into the picture. And also we will be talking about volume populator, which is better into 1.24. Uh, and again, Kazi is in the picture as well because it serves as a backup repository to store your backups. Next slides, please. Now let's dive into individual the components, right? Um, the first one is called volume model convention. Uh, so why we need this? Uh, initially, the there are there are two two things over here goes contradiction. Uh, the story starts when you allow volume model transition blindly, and it may introduce vulnerability to the kernel. And which is against the security rule. So the the uh, if you take for example if you take a snapshot of uh, block devices, and you try to rehydrate it into a file system PVC, and that file system PVC may well contain uh, compromised sections that can cause issues to your kernel. 
uh, this is a security vulnerability and we have to solve that. However, this feature is needed in a backup workflow. So it's not rare that you take a snapshot of your file system PVC, but instead of doing file-based differences calculation, you want to do block level differences uh, for efficiency. Um, in this case, you literally want to rehydrate the snapshot into a block PVC and then from there to calculate the block differences and shift all the differences, the block differences off of the site uh, to your backup repository. So given that on one hand, it's a security vulnerability, on the other hand, there's a need in your backup workflow. So what do we do? So what we do here is to exercise, please uh, introduce this um, volume model convention. So how it works is that in our volume snapshot content resource as of today, we introduce a source volume model. And this source volume model basically suggests uh, from what kind of volume this snapshot is taken from, right? It, whether it's a block device or it's a five six file system. So, uh, and on top of that, an annotation, which is part of the API contract, called allo, allo uh, volume model change is added on the content. So the behavior is when the uh, reconciler tries to rehydrate the PVC, uh, the worm snap, uh, the, the, uh, the reconciler tries to rehydrate worm, a volume from a worm snapshot, it checks whether the annotation is there. Uh, if it has, it is there, has it been set to two before it even tries to rehydrate the volume. And this way we leave the control uh, to the end users uh, because volume snapshot content is actually uh, a non namespaced resource. So we're expecting the users to clearly articulate whether this snapshot can be rehydrated into a different type of volume uh, during the rehydration time. So uh, this is basically the API change. Next slide, please. Right now, this effort has been moved to uh, one point to beta in 1.27. Huge call out to the dev lead Ronak Shah. Uh, this is kept uh, the kept link and the alpha block is there. Beta block will come in also. Uh, moving on, uh, we are coming to cover volume populator. So uh, this is another component which is needed in the restoration path. So why we're doing this? So uh, when we create a PVC from some external data source, the uh, we used to limit which data sources we can rehydrate PVC from. So it used to only support uh, volume snapshot as well as uh, another, an, another PVC. So this is to allow the uh, backup systems to plug in any format the volume backup mechanism is to rehydrate the PVC. So uh, this is now also supporting wait for the first consumer binding model. Uh, going next slides, please. So there are a couple of components that uh, being developed have been developed in this effort. So the first thing is the uh, a volume populator will need some kind of signal. Think, imagine is a controller or it's a pod running in your cluster. It needs to, you know, rely on some kind of signal to trigger its actions. So a CRD, it's it was uh, it is supports will be created to trigger the events. Uh, it, this CRD will be part of the data source reference of a PVC. The volume populated con controller then watches the PVC creation and examines the data source field. If it is a, it sees the data, so data source field it, it understands, then it takes its action. Uh, there are also other Kubernetes CSI building components being uh, developed. Uh, one of this is the library, which is effectively the API. Uh, each individual volume populators can use uh, to develop the controllers. 
uh, the logic for actually rehydrated data is left to individual and populators to implement it, but the interface there is kind of fixed uh, to provide consistent way of implementation. Uh, the, there's also a validator that has been implemented, which generates volume, uh, uh, volume events on PVCs with data source. Uh, if there is no such a volume populator or some, some error happened during the process. Uh, let's move on to the next slide to go exactly how it works. On the right side, uh, there are two Kubernetes resources. One is named uh, example hello, and the kind is hello. Uh, this is the CRD we're talking about, uh, which specifies, uh, which tells which volume populator the, uh, there should be, uh, which volume populator should pick up this request. So uh, the other one is embedded into the V1 persistent volume claim, the PVC ob object. It, we, you can see we introduced this data source references actually it points to the uh, CRD that is specified above. So in order to use this feature, you need to enable the any volume Data source feature gate. Uh, it is better in 1.24, so by default it should be on. Uh, the the volume data source validator controller needs to be deployed into the cluster such that all the events can be populated in the PVC, and the individual or specify a special volume populator that developed by your backup vendor or whoever needs to be deployed into the cluster. So the workflow looks like you create a CR that the a volume populator is aware of, and the volume populator will watch the creation of this CR. And then you create a PVC with the data source pointing to that CR. Uh, in the example, the PVC points to the hello exa example hello resources. So the corresponding volume populator then makes sure uh, a PV is created and then populate it with the data from the corresponding data source specified in your example hello. All right, this one, uh, it's of your format. So for example, in this case, it says file name is the example.txt and the content is like this. Uh, after all this is done, then uh, the PVC, uh, the PV will be bounded to a PVC that you specify, and then you can start to use the PVC with all your data already in place. Uh, with this, I'm, uh, with this, it will make the restore workflow more uh, flexible to allow different volume populators to plug in their own logic, how to rehydrate the volume. Next slide, please. A uh, huge call out to the dev lead Ben, who have been almost single-handed implementing all this logic in the community. And right now it is in beta, in, it is already in beta for a couple of cycles. The next step is really to move this effort to GA. Uh, and there are a couple of reference links over there. Uh, if you're interested, feel free to click through them. Uh, with this, I will transfer to Shin to go through other components in this community. Thanks, Shanchen. I'm going to talk about CBT. This is a feature that the Data Protection Wing Group is actively working on. CBT stands for Change Block Tracking. As its name suggests, it identifies blocks of data that have been changed. It enables incremental backups. Without CBT, backup vendors have to do full backups all the time. This is not space efficient, takes longer time to complete, and needs more bandwidth. Another use case is snapshot-based replication, where you take snapshots periodically and replicate to another site for disaster recovery purpose. Without CBT, this solution becomes highly inefficient. Without a standard CBT API, we can either do full backups or call each storage vendor's API individually to retrieve CBT, which is not ideal. We do have a cap 
that is based on aggregated API server to avoid persisting CPT records in the Kubernetes API server. However, there are concerns regarding the design. So now the data protection working group have been working on a new design that proposes to introduce a Kubernetes API to create a session to request changed block information and a gRPC API to retrieve data on this changed blocks in a session. There will be a new CSI CBT sidecar and CSI driver needs to implement the CBT logic. The CBT project is led by Ivan and Prasad. There are also others who are contributing. Next, I'm going to talk about backup repository. Backup repository is a location or a repo to store data. This can be an object store or NFS or other type of storage. It could be in a cloud or an on-prem location. There are two types of data to be backed up that we need at the restore time. They are Kubernetes cluster metadata and snapshot data. We need to back them up and store them in a backup repository. There is a project called Cozy aimed at supporting object store in Kubernetes. Cozy provides Kubernetes APIs to provision object buckets and allow the buckets to be consumed by the pod. It also introduces gRPC interfaces for object storage providers to write drivers to provision buckets. There are three Cozy components. Cozy components include a Cozy controller manager that binds Cozy created buckets to the bucket claims. A Cozy sidecar that watches Cozy Kubernetes API objects and calls a Cozy driver. A Cozy driver that implements gRPC interfaces to provision buckets. There are two sets of Cozy Kubernetes APIs. The relationship between the bucket, bucket claim, and bucket class is very similar to that for PV, PVC, and storage class. There are also Kubernetes APIs to allow a pod to access a bucket. As shown here, the bucket is in the cluster scope. It represents a physical bucket in the storage system. And the bucket claim is a request of a user for a bucket. And the bucket class allows admin to describe what type of bucket will be provisioned. It supports three protocols, A3, Azure, and GCS. And here we have bucket access class, which specifies the type of authentication. Authentication type includes key, which is the default, or IAM, which uses a service account token. In the bucket access, we specify bucket access class name and bucket claim name and credentials. First, user creates a pod with a projected volume pointing to the secret in the bucket access. Then the secret containing bucket info is mounted in the specified directory. Seed and Akash have been leading the Cozy project. This project moved to alpha status in Kubernetes 1.25 release. There are weekly standout meetings on Thursdays. Join the meeting if you are interested in learning more about it and contributing to the project. If you are a storage vendor that has an object storage product, you are welcome to write a driver for Cozy. I included a link for a blog post here for your reference. Now I want to talk about Quiet and unquiet hooks. We needed these hooks to Quiet application before taking a snapshot and unquiet afterwards to ensure application consistency. We investigated how Quiet unquiet works in different types of workloads. They have different semantics. Our goal is to design a generic mechanism to run commands 
in containers. We currently have a proposal called Container Notifier. It proposes a way to specify a pod inline definition to run a command to quiet and unquiet an application. The proposal applies to general cases beyond quiet and unquiet. The cap is still being reviewed. We talked about the container notify proposal, which tries to ensure application consistency. What if you can't quiet the application or if the application quiet is too expensive, so you want to do it less frequently, but still want to be able to take a crash consistent snapshot more frequently? Also, an application may require the snapshots from multiple volumes to be taken at the same point in time. There's also a performance element here. It's much more efficient to take one snapshot across all volumes in one step if the storage system supports it, then take one snapshot of volume at a time. That's why when consistent group snapshot comes into the picture. In the consistent group snapshot design, we have a volume group snapshot that is a namespaced object. It represents a user's request for group snapshot. We have a volume group snapshot content that is in the cluster scope. It represents a group snapshot on the storage system. And we have a volume group snapshot class that defines the type of group snapshot by the admin. There are new CSI gRPC interfaces to create, delete, get volume group snapshots. New logic that manages the life cycle of volume group snapshots is being added to the snapshot controller and the CSI snapshotter sidecar. The cap for consistent group snapshot was merged. We are targeting alpha in 1.27 release. I'm leading this feature. Ronak Shah, Niels, Davos, and a few others are working very hard on this project. Big shout out to them. A blog post will be out soon. Next, I'm going to talk about application snapshot and backup. We have snapshot APIs for individual volumes, but what about protecting a stable application? There is a cap submitted that proposes a Kubernetes API that defines what is a stateful application and how to take a snapshot backup of those stateful applications. The cap is still in very early design stage. Now let's take a look of this diagram again. Cozy moved to alpha in 1.25 release. Volume mode conversion moved to beta in 1.27. Consistent group snapshot is targeting alpha in 1.27. And in this diagram, volume populator moved to beta in 1.24. As shown in these diagrams, we have made progress. The colors of cozy, volume populator, consistent group snapshot have changed from yellow working progress to green existing. We hope to make more progress in the future. Now, let me talk about how to get involved. We have a data protection within group community page here. It has lots of information to help you get started. We have bi-weekly meetings on Wednesdays and we have a mailing list and a Slack channel. Join us and get involved. That's all we have today. Thank you for thank you all for attending. Bye bye.